saw an article uh, just recently. Um, uh, it was printed a little while back, but it was in the Washington Post, the, new, the American newspaper. And it said, um, it said that uh, students were bored of history. Anyone was a student here once upon a time that found the topic of history boring? Yes, okay. I wasn't the only one, okay. Uh, but history is, history is what they call a social science. And they did a survey and they surveyed year 6 students and year 12 students, or 6th grade and 12th grade, and tried to find out why they found history boring. And they said, well, because it's just a bunch of uh, you know, just a bunch of information about dates and dead people, and you've got to memorize it all, right? Um, but what if there's a lot more to history? What if history actually informs us today? History serves a purpose. History serves a poor purpose. And uh, I want to share with you a quote from the 34th President of the United States of America, who understood the purpose that history served. President Eisenhower, or Ike as he was known. I want you to notice the quote, uh, a quote uh, from um, President Eisenhower. He says, Neither a wise man nor a brave man lies down on the tracks of history to wait for the train of the future to run over, to run over him. Do you know what he means by that? You've got to be alert to history. You've got to stand on the tracks of history in order to know what's coming up ahead. You can't go to sleep, otherwise the future is going to catch you unaware. Does that make sense? And you won't be prepared today for what is coming. And so our topic is a question of history. How did we get here? Jesus employed the same principle. In John 14, verse 29, we read, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, so once it's happened, that's what we call history, isn't that right? You might, what everyone? You might believe. And so here's the principle. Look to the things that have passed that you may see the prophetic word of God fulfilled and believe. Amen? Believe what? Believe the truth, yes? Or believe in Him, isn't that right? The author of truth. Believe in God. And so this morning, I believe there may be the wise and the brave among us that are going to study history in the context of the prophecies that speak to our world today. And there is no more intriguing and, let me say, confronting prophecy than that which we find in the book of Daniel. A series of prophecies, and that's what we're going to look at today. Written some 2,600 years today, we're going to unpack the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We won't go there. Uh, you don't have to go there in your, in your Bibles because I'm going to have it on the screen for you. But we're going to look at this prophecy. Now, many of you know or are familiar with this prophecy, yes? yes. Have you heard the, the prophecy of these uh, vicious beasts? Okay. Lion, bear, leopard, and so forth. We're going to unpack that today a little bit more as part of this series. And I want you to go with me now to around 556 BC when, uh, when Daniel uh, was living under Babylonian rule. And the vision in Daniel 7 begins this way, as Daniel records. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his head. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters, or the summary of what he has seen. Now, Belshazzar was co-regent with his father as king um, called Nabonidus. give you an idea. So he was co-regent. And when you were co-regent, you had equal power. You could act on behalf of the king. And so Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. And so we, we date that to around 556 BC. And Daniel goes on, he says, uh, it says here in verses 1 to 3, Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night and four great what? Beasts come up from the sea, diverse one from another. And so we'll notice those beasts there. This is just an artist's impression of those beasts rising up 
out of the sea. It goes on to say, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And behold, a, another beast, a second, keep track of the number, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it. And after this I beheld, lo, another like a, what everyone? Like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. And it was diverse. What's another word for diverse? It was different. Notice the fourth beast was different. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, that we just read about. And it had what? Ten it had ten horns. goes on and says, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up, by the roots and behold in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things and so this is the vision that that daniel had that's recorded there okay now we don't need to guess in terms of what this is talking about because god's not going to give us something and leave us guessing amen God's written something and the Bible sometimes employs symbolism here in the book of Daniel as well in the book of Revelation where we need the, the Word of God itself to help us to understand. You know, and sometimes when I study prophecy in the Bible, I, I look at sometimes what other people are saying uh, in the Christian community about, about Bible prophecy. And it just blows my mind how people are coming up with all kinds of things. Why? Because they're not allowing the Bible to be its own interpreter. And so Daniel is not left wondering what these beasts mean. In fact, in the, if you keep reading in, in that same chapter, you find out that Daniel is informed as to what these beasts signify. And so we read in verse 17, These great beasts which are four are four what? Four kings which shall arise. So what does a beast represent? A king, isn't that right? Notice what it speaks about the fourth kingdom here. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So kings and kings are synonymous with... Uh, kings and kingdom is synonymous. You can't have a king without a kingdom, amen? And you can't have a kingdom without a king. And so the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be what, everyone? Notice again, diverse or different from the other kingdoms. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are... Ten what? Ten kings that shall arise. So what is a horn a symbol of? A king or a? Or a kingdom. Can you see that? That's verse 23. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And notice it says now, another shall what? Rise when? After them. Another shall rise after them. So we've got these four beasts, right? The lion, the bear, the leopard, and this nondescript beast described sounds somewhat like a dragon, and I believe there's a purpose for that. Because in Revelation chapter 12, someone is described as a dragon. Does anyone remember who it is? The devil, the devil himself, isn't that right? Satan is described as the dragon in Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. And so it says that... Um, Another shall arise after them. Four beasts, dragon-like beasts. He has ten horns. Those ten horns represent ten kingdoms as well. And then another horn or another kingdom arises after them. And it is a little kingdom. Now, it's, it's quite simple to unpack who this is because the book of Daniel employs what we call a repeat an enlarged principle. In other words, there are things that God, are sta God is stating in the book of Daniel that he repeats and then he enlarges upon it each time. And, and the kingdoms that he's referring to here are these kingdoms here. Can you see that? Okay, so we have here who? Babylon? Medo-Persia? Greece? And Rome? How do we know that?
If you notice here, um, it's got Daniel 2 vision. Then it's got Daniel 7 vision. And then it's got Daniel 8 vision. And we find out that these kingdoms are represented in each of these chapters, but each time God uh, speaks about these kingdoms, He enlarges upon them. And so Daniel was living in the time of what kingdom? Babylon, when he had this vision, isn't that right? But now he's been shown other beasts that are going to arise, which means that Babylon is going to... Babylon's going to fall, that's right. Babylon is going to fall. And we know that in the, in the Daniel 2 image, we have the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver. And we are dealing with world empires here that would arise. Babylon ruled the then known world. Then who conquered Babylon? The Medes and the Persians. They ruled the then known world. And then came the kingdom of Greece. And Greece ruled the then known world. And which was the fourth kingdom there? Rome. Rome conquered Greece. Okay became known as the Greco-Roman Empire, but Rome conquered Greece. And when we get to Daniel chapter 8, God uses different symbolism again. He uses a ram and a he-goat, if you read it there. And, so, and, and, and God goes as far as, as naming those kingdoms. Notice here, the ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of what? Medo-Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the, is the first king. Can you see that? So you don't even have to guess, right? Because as God repeats this prophecy using different symbolism, first he used an image, then he used the lion, the bear, the leopard, and this uh, dragon-like beast, and so forth. And then you get to Daniel chapter 8, he's using the, the, uh, you know, a ram and a goat. But in each case, he's dealing with the same kingdoms. And in Daniel chapter 8, he begins to name the kingdoms, though they haven't yet arisen. That's called prophecy. That's called prophecy. I can't really tell you what tomorrow is going to hold. I can guess. But when God speaks, He calls it as it is. Amen? That's why Jesus said the very hairs on your head are numbered. Because He knows you. He knows. He knows when you're going to drop a hair tomorrow. You know, I was vacuuming the house this week. And uh, my wife will tell you, I was complaining. I said, I said, the vacuum's getting stuck because it's getting jammed up with all this hair. And I've got three women in the house. I said, you guys molting or what, right? <laughs> God knows the very number of hairs on your head because he knows the end from the beginning. And so it's very understandable in, term, in, in fact, of what, uh, in, in reference to what God is showing Daniel, we are dealing with the rise of nations. Now, there is a reason for this prophecy, right? Because this prophecy speaks to our day. It speaks to our day. Now, these kingdoms, they're etched in stone. This prophecy was etched in stone. What we're talking about here is nothing new. Uh, it, People have been interpreting this prophecy as I'm sharing it with you here for centuries and centuries. In fact, if you visited Nuremberg in Germany today, you'd look on the city hall and you would see statues reflecting this prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. If you notice there, can you see the, uh, the lion on the left and the bear on the right? And the kings there, that represents, that's King Nebuchadnezzar there, king of Babylon. And then you get uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, represented by the bear. If you keep looking there, you'll find out there is the four-headed uh, four beast or leopard. And that represents, does anyone know? That the person sitting there with the four-leopard beast? That's Alexander the Great. And then you come to Rome. And uh, notice there it's got uh, those horns as well. You come to the Roman emperor. Can you see that? Quite incredible. And this, this was uh, built around the 1600s, friends. So this is nothing new in terms of what we are sharing here in Bible prophecy. And there's that. And we also get the ten horns. And I want you to notice, do you notice something on the, in the middle of, that, of those ten horns? You notice 
a, there's another horn there and there's a little head on that horn. That represents the little horn that Daniel also saw rising up after those ten horns. You see, friends, when God looks at this world, He's interested in what the nations are doing. Notice what He says here. It says, A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a what? A controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. I've, I've misquoted there. That's from the book of Jeremiah in terms of the reference. But he says, the Bible says that the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will what, everyone? He will plead. He will plead with all flesh. He will plead with the nations. What is he pleading? He's pleading the blood of his son for this world. And he's calling a nations and he's calling a people to repentance. My friends, if God knows the rise of nations, then certainly he can plead with the nations, amen? And he's calling a people to repentance. You know, and when we look at these nations, they, te they teach us of, of how, uh, you know, of sometimes of the pride and arrogance, arrogancy associated with the nations, and sometimes how, how God has tried to reach these nations and how they've responded. In fact, if we think of, if we think of um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the king, he was represented by the head of gold, isn't that right? And the lion. And uh, Babylon was this mighty nation. And God spoke to him through that image of that statue, the head of gold. And, and Daniel said to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, but after you shall arise another kingdom. And what did King Nebuchadnezzar do in response to that? Yeah. First he said, oh yes, truly, Daniel, your God knows my dreams and my visions. But after a little while, while pride got the better of him. You know pride, it's that thing that really lifts it uplifts ourselves above God it, you know we put ourselves in the place of God when really God should have first place amen and Nebuchadnezzar he did this and he went and, he, and, and went and built a whole statue of gold you can read it there in Daniel chapter 3 and he called the world to worship him and how did God respond to his pride God chastened him. The Bible says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. For whomsoever the Lord loves, he corrects. And he loved King Nebuchadnezzar. But he chastened him. Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind once he built that statue and attempted to persecute those faithful three Jewish boys that would not bow down to that image, but would bow down to God alone. And then in Daniel chapter 4, we get King Nebuchadnezzar who authors that chapter, the whole chapter himself. And he says this about this God because he repents. He says, oh, this God is too much for me. And he recognizes that there is only one king, one God. And he repents. And in, in chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar writes, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is what? An everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from? generation to generation this is a king of babylon god's pleading with the nations amen and he speaks to king nebuchadnezzar and king nebuchadnezzar came to learn the vital lesson the vital lesson that god has an everlasting kingdom and what does it say his dominion is from what generation to Generation. How is it that his kingdom is from generation to generation? Because, my friends, God has to be the king of our lives. He has to give the th we have to give him his rightful place. And we have to allow him to sit on the throne of our hearts. 
And so we, are rep we represent, you know, different generations here, don't we? Old and young. Yes. Just in Hoxton Park Church here today. And my king wants to be the king of the next generation and the next generation. Amen? Because that's his rightful place. And, and Jesus put it this way. He said, The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? Is within you. Is the kingdom of God within you? Is he your king? Is he your king? You see, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The earthly kingdoms and the temporal kingdoms, they, they've lost their way. And people are putting their, their trust in, in man, hoping that things are going to change. But there is one that never changes. And so God is the King of kings. He's the one that ought to have the throne in our hearts. But we go on after Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar learns his lesson. God then speaks to, to King Cyrus. And you, for some of you, you'd be familiar with this prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to what? Subdue nations before him. And you know what? This was written 150 years before Cyrus came and conquered as a king. And God had already named him in the Scriptures. For what purpose do you think God had named him in the Scriptures? Do you know what Isaiah 46 says? Uh, verse 9 and 10 says, he says, I am God and there's none else. I am God, there is none like me, able to declare the end from the beginning. And before things come to pass, I tell you of them, so that my counsel shall stand and I will do all my good pleasure. God's got a purpose and he's got a plan and he's going to bring it to pass no matter what. And so sometimes he works with men, he worked with kings, he, 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 he catches their attention and he begins to speak to them, he begins to reveal himself and in that process he reveals himself to that nation as well. Because he's pleading with all flesh. For the wicked will not stand. He pleads with them while mercy lingers. As he does for you and me. And when now we look into history, that's the incredible thing, right? We look into history and we get to see these things that, that Jesus told us we ought to look for, the things that, are for, that have been predicted and foretold. So we might have, what was the purpose Jesus said to us? That we might believe, isn't that right? Yes. That we might believe. I um, want to quote to you from a historian this, uh, by the name of Josephus. And, and he's quoting Cyrus, and, and he speaks about Cyrus in his book called Antiquities of the Jews. And you notice here, out of his book, he says, I believe that he is, quoting Cyrus, I believe that he is that God which the nation of the Israelites worship, for indeed he foretold my what? My name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house at Jerusalem in the country of Judea. And when you read the book of Ezra, you see a decree going forth from the Persian king that the children of Israel can go and build and rebuild their temple. And, and here this, this Persian king, who has now come to the knowledge of this God that has named him in the Scriptures before he came, 150 years before, he has favor toward the children of Israel. God is working in favor of his people. He's working in favor of his people. But you know what? It's not an easy task, is it? When you read the book of Ezra, read the book of Nehemiah, oh, those Persians, they try to stop the building. They try to stop them from building that temple. Why? Because the temple holds the knowledge of God and holds the knowledge of the plan of salvation in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But there's a decree 
And you find that they each time they go back and they reference the decree and they're allowed to continue. And they say, no, 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 we've got to look. And goes, you know, messages go back to the king's courts and, they, and, and the successive kings look. Even King Artaxerxes looks when he comes to the throne and says, yeah, no, no, there's a decree. Allow them to build. Allow them to build. Because God is pleading with the nations. What was the next king that came after Cyrus in the next kingdom? Remember we said it? Alexander the Great. Here's a, a, a mural of where Alexander is conquering the Persians in battle. I want, you to, I want to quote you from Josephus again. Now, Josephus is quoting Alexander. He's quoting Alexander. Here's what Alexander said. When he came into Jerusalem, okay, once he had conquered and so forth, he came, he came across the priesthood of the Jewish priests and he said this, and notice how God spoke to the mind of Alexander. Remember in, in Daniel chapter 8, okay, he was that, the, that first horn, that fir, that horn of Grisha, yeah. right? Remember we looked at that? He was the, the, the goat that came against the ram, the ram being Medes and Persia, the goat and the horn being the first king of Grisha. That is the first king of Greece as a world empire, that is. And notice Alexander says here, I did not adore him. But that God who has honoured him with his high priesthood, notice he's looking at the high priest, for I saw this very person where? In a dream, in this very habit or clothing, when I was at Dios in Macedonia. God revealed the high priest of Israel to, to, um, to Alexander in a dream. And so that when he came and conquered, and he finally comes, he says, hold on a moment, I've seen this before, I've seen this man before, even while I was yet in Macedonia. And Josephus goes on to record, and when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that he himself was the person indeed. See that? They showed him Daniel 8. Look, it says, meet a Persia here. And it says Greece is going to come and destroy the Persians. And that was Alexander. And, and, and this horn must be you, Alexander. And Alexander looked and he said, well, who else could it be? Who else could it be? And then he had great favor to the people. The next day he called them to him. And bid them ask what favours they pleased of him. And Alexander had favour to the people of God. Oh, God is working. He's always been working, friends. Amen. To open up the mind to the reality. The reality that he is present. He is present in this world. He is working in this world. Why do we get so overwhelmed? By circumstance, why do we get so overwhelmed with what other people are doing? Why do we lose our faith? Jesus said when we, when we see these things and we look in the pages of history and we see the things fulfilled, we ought to believe, amen. We ought to be firm in the faith. We ought to know there is a God that lives and He's got this world in His hands. We don't need to worry. And sometimes we get so discouraged by what people are doing and other people are doing, even in the church. Come on. God's got this world in His hands. I'm sure He's got Hoxham Park in His hands as well. Amen? Amen. And if He's got Hoxham Park in His hands, I'm sure He's got every family in His hands. And if He's got every family in His hands, I'm sure He's got you in His hands. Amen? But now in this vision, Daniel's attention now, in, in vision now, he... There's, there's something that really arrests his attention. And this is where he wants to understand uh, this, this vision the most. Because it's something that is confronting, and generally we speak of it in terms of the Antichrist power that arises. And there's no mistaking. When we study the book of Daniel, who this is, Daniel, says, uh, Daniel writes, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Who was the fourth beast? Rome. And the beast was a kingdom, isn't that right? Yes. It was the kingdom of Rome, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up. 
that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things. Verse 25, he records, He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. You know, there's quite a lot said here about this little horn, little horn being a little kingdom. Okay, he will speak against the Most High. Who's the Most High? That's God Himself, isn't it? And He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High. Who are the saints? That's God's people, isn't it? He's going to persecute God's people. Now, this is the biblical definition of saints. Saints are not people living up somewhere in heaven. or you know, that, That's an unbiblical teaching. We'll probably find out how we, how we come to that kind of belief as we continue to study. But no one's going to be persecuting the saints in heaven, are they? No, persecution takes place down here. And it says, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. That's God's times and laws. And the, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. I don't go into too much detail on that. Okay? But I'll give you the references so that you can check me out on that and you can write that down. But the fourth kingdom here is the kingdom of Rome. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ credits to Rome such great power that it would come against the kingdom of God and His people like no other earthly empire dared to do. Did you know Jesus pointed to Rome as this kingdom that would come against God and come against His saints? We find it in the book of Matthew. We can read about it in the book of Luke. Let me share that with you. The first part is from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. And when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel, Daniel the prophet. Notice Jesus is pointing back 600 years. And he continues in, in Luke, speaking of the same power. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed or surrounded with armies, then know that the what? The desolation is near. Then know the desolation is near. And my friends, that desolation came... Oh, should have stayed on that slide there. Uh, in 70 AD, when, the, when Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed and the Roman armies marched against the Jewish people and, and Jesus warned them of that impending doom, the abomination of desolation. Desolation means to wipe out. Abomination is something that is, is unholy in the sight of God. Something that is unholy in the sight of God. You know God often talks to us about what is holy and what is unholy. Amen? Yeah. You know? And when God tells us something is unholy, it ought to be unholy. Yeah. When God tells us something is holy, it ought to be holy. Yeah. We use another term. We say righteousness and unrighteousness. That which is right is right, and that which is wrong is wrong. But we don't take God at, at His word sometimes. It's like we play with God and the nations play with God. The nations play God. Like Nebuchadnezzar attempted to play God. And here comes this, this kingdom that's going to play God. Comes against God and His people. I want to share with you now, remember history, we're looking into history. That's our focus, right? Because the study of history helps us to understand where we are today and what is up ahead. Amen? Speaking of this fourth kingdom, if you read in the uh, encyclopedia, sorry, encyclopedia, you can go online. I went online, I got this information. This is available to all of us, okay? Uh, this is from Ancient Encyclopedia Online. Notice it says, The old empire was ravaged, among others, by Burgundians and Anglo-Saxons, Lombards. To many historians, the fall of the Western Roman Empire has been viewed as the end of the what? of the ancient world and the onset of the Middle Ages. You see, what happened was Rome was in power. Jesus points to Rome as this, as this powerful kingdom that comes. 
and destroys and wipes out. And that's the fourth kingdom that we read about in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. We read about in Daniel chapter 8 as well. Okay? But this kingdom, remember it had ten horns, isn't that right? Signifying that out of that kingdom are going to come another ten kingdoms or divisions out of the Roman Empire. And what is being stated here in this encyclopedia is that, as we can see there on that map, we can see that there are barbarian tribes that are invading the Roman Empire, particularly Western Rome. And uh, it's got up there the Huns and, and the Goths and the Vandals, the Franks and the Anglo-Saxons. And they effectively bring the Roman Empire to its knees. Because Rome cannot withstand the onslaught. And those kingdoms eventually become the kingdoms of Western Europe as we know them today. It's incredible how God is foretelling the demise of the ancient Roman Empire. You see, remember there were four beasts, isn't that right? There was no fifth world empire. God signifying that this fourth world empire comes to an end. But it's not altogether destroyed because there is a little horn that comes out of it. Isn't that right? It comes out of Rome. But Rome as a world empire ceases to exist. And historians say that's the end of the ancient, uh, the ancient world uh, as we know it. And, and we now find ourselves moving into what's called the Middle Ages. Let me share with you another statement here as it goes on. During the same era, old institutions and traditions from consuls to chariot races slowly vanished away. That was Roman life back then under, under what we would call pagan Rome and historians call pagan Rome. The Senate, whose real power had faded centuries earlier, was the last to go. Amen? Amen? So who is the little horn now that comes out of Rome? And comes out where? Where does the little horn arise from? Doesn't the Bible tell us? From those divisions, isn't that right? From those divisions comes up the little horn out of the Roman Empire out of the area we know as Western Europe today. And of course, the Anglo-Saxons, for example, became the English. The Franks became the French as we know them today. France. Okay? And you can see those European nations there today. The Suevi became Portugal, or the Portuguese. The Lombards became the Italians, or Italy as we know it today. God has a controversy with the nations. But the controversy only stands when they don't respond to his pleading. And they don't recognize that there is a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. Don't worry about what the Australian government is doing. Remember there is a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. And notice as the encyclopedia goes on. It says the Pope, who took the title of Pontifex Maximus, that belonged to the Roman Emperor, who took the title of Pontifex Maximus, or chief priest, had been used by Western Roman Emperors. That had been used by Western Roman Emperors became the what? The city's ruler. It was at this time that classical Rome became transformed to what? Medieval Papal Rome. Well, that's out of the history books. It's just a question of history, isn't that right? But history in the light of Bible prophecy causes us to believe. And so when Daniel goes on, it says, He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until they what? A time, times, and dividing of time. Now that's Jewish language. A time is one year, times is two years, and a dividing of time is half a year. You get three and a half years when you put that together. This timeline prophecy is repeated a number of times in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. 
There should be no uncertainty when it comes to what God is trying to say here in reference to this timeline. Now, we are dealing with Bible prophecy, aren't we? Predictions about the future. So time in Bible prophecy needs to be understood by using a biblical principle that God employs for timeline prophecy, and that is one day equals a year. I told you I won't go into too much detail, but I want to give you two references. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. Numbers 14, verse 34. God foretells and is prophesying that because of the rebelliousness of Israel in his attempt to lead them into the promised land, that they will wander in the wilderness for a period of time. And he reckons that to the time they spied out the land, when they went and had a look to see if it was a good land. They were there for 40 days. And in Numbers 14, verse 34, God says, I reckon each day for a year, now you will wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Day for a year. We see it again in reference to a prophecy given to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. This is not unique to Seventh-day Adventists. This is, this is Protestantism, friends. But not many people are employing this principle today, even though it's come straight out of the Word of God. And so this little horn would rise sometimes after the demise of the Roman Empire, and, and, and historians date that to be 476 AD, the demise of Rome as a world empire. I had that in, in the uh, ancient encyclopedia as well, but I didn't quote it for you because of time's sake. But we find out that this little horn, or now papal Rome, because Rome continues, it just... It just morphs from pagan Rome into papal Rome. This kingdom comes up, this little horn comes up in 538 AD. And it comes up by virtue of a Roman emperor by the name of Justinian. And he legislated some things called the Code of Justinian. And in this, in this code, he gave complete authority to the Bishop of Rome to be the overseer of all the church, the worldwide. That would be like, um, that would be like our Prime Minister of Australia coming to me and saying, Andrew, you're going to be the leader of all the church worldwide. And Andrew and I'm going to support, we're going to support you, the government, whatever you need, you let us know. Now, Australia doesn't have that kind of power, right? But that's kind of what it's saying, right? But the emperor of Rome had that kind of power. And notice here, as we quote from Justinian, it says, Therefore we have exerted ourselves. Now, this uh, Justinian is speaking to the bishop of Rome or the what will be the Pope, okay? Therefore we have exerted ourselves to unite all the priests of the East and subject them to the sea of your holiness, who is in the West, in Rome, because you are the head of what? All the holy churches. Notice what the Bible is declaring here. It's declaring that, that a power will arise that will presume to have authority and power over all the church given to it by the Roman Emperor. Now, I, I say notice that because it really doesn't matter what we believe or choose to believe. Amen? This is what the Bible is declaring. I say that because some like to think, oh, you know, we belong to this denomination, we belong to that denomination. No, 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 no. The Bible is declaring that a power, an antichrist power, will presume to have such authority that it would exercise those things that would stand in opposition to the kingdom of God. God has a controversy with the nations. And all who follow after this power, God will have a controversy with the nations. And what's happening here, friends, is what we call a coming together of church and state. a coming together of church and state, where the state will enforce what the church desire, desires. Notice it goes, uh, when, actually I wanted to read you from now the, the Catholic Encyclopedia online. This is there today, you can go and grab it online today. It's right there today. Catholic Encyclopedia. Because this now marks the beginning of the Middle Ages, isn't that right? 
or what we know as the Dark Ages, and Rome now, in, in the form of papalism, becomes a persecuting power even against the Christians that will not conform. Notice here, nearly all ecclesiastical legislation, look, we're looking at history, right? Nearly all ecclesiastical legislation, that's church legislation, in regard to the repression of heresy, proceeds upon the assumption that heretics are in willful revolt against what? Lawful authority. That they are in fact apostates that have renounced what? The true faith. You notice Roman Catholicism claims to have the true faith, but anyone who speaks up against it, it denounces as heretics. They are in willful revolt against the church. My friends, this isn't Catholic Online today. Has anything changed? Notice here, it goes on. It is easy to see that in the Middle Ages, it's talking now about this persecution of Christians during the Middle Ages. It is easy to see that in the Middle Ages, this was not an unreasonable assumption. The church of God was then indeed as a city set upon a hill. No one could be ignorant of her claims. And if certain people repudiated her authority, it was by an act of what? Rebellion. This at least was the case with the Cathari, the Waldenses, and the Albigenses, with the Lollards and the Hussites, and it was still the case with the immediate followers of Luther, of Calvin, of Knox, and of the other early reformers. It's talking about the Protestants. It's talking about the Protestant churches. They're in willful revolt. They revolted against the Church of Rome. And so, and you can see an image of the persecution uh, under Roman church authority by virtue of the kings and queens of Europe. Spain, you can read about the Spanish Inquisition. You can read about the Roman Inquisition. Tortured and persecuted Bible-believing Christians because they oppose the teaching of popery. The teachings of the church. Now, if there's any doubt, we just have to remember the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Who was it that crucified Christ? It was the unification of church and the state of Rome. Isn't that right? It was the unification of church and the state of Rome. And Rome had an opportunity. God, through Christ, was pleading. What did Jesus say to Pontius? Pilate, I'm not of this world. He said, I'm not of this world. I've come to bear witness of the truth. But what did Pilate say? What is truth? And Pilate feared man more than he did God. Yes. He wanted to keep the peace. Yes. And he crucified Christ along with the voice of the church. And Jesus, foreseeing the rise of the abomination of desolation, seeing its persecuting power against his people, he said... If they have persecuted me, they will what? Also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. These were not just idle words, friends. These were not just idle words. And the Bible says that Rome would last for 1,260 years. Remember the time, times, divine of times? 1,260 days, a day for a year. 1,260 years. And so it's well taught and has been for some time in Protestantism that for 1,260 years, Rome would continue. In 538 AD, by, under the Code of Justinian, she was established in power. 1,260 years from 538 AD into the future brings us to 1798 AD. And what happened in 1798 AD? Go with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. 
Oh, it's just a question of history in the light of Bible prophecy. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And John here is referencing, Christ is giving a reference to Daniel chapter 7 in the vision given to John here. Um, notice here, Re uh, Revelation 13, verse 2 and 3. And the beast which I saw, notice he's seen a beast, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Notice the reference to the lion, the bear, the leopard. Amen. Yeah. Where are you going to go if you want to know who this beast is? Yeah. You've got to go back to Daniel chapter 7. Isn't that right? But now John is in this vision. And he says the dragon or Satan is giving this kingdom his power and his seat, the seat of Rome, and great authority. And notice in verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were what? Wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And what? All the world wandered after the beast. When we talk about all the world, that's worldwide worship. All the world wandered after this beast. And we know it's speaking about the same beast of Daniel 7. Because notice in verse 5 it says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, or one thousand two hundred sixty days by the by the Jewish year reckoning. Same as Daniel seven. Look at verse seven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. My friends, the Bible says there. It specifies the same time, 1,260 years. Which brings us to 1798. But in reference to the beast, it says that he received a deadly wound. We didn't read that in Daniel 7, did we? But we read it in Revelation, he received a deadly wound, and the deadly wound was healed. Here's an old cartoon from the uh, 1800s that references Napoleon Bonaparte. As he takes the, th the throne, oh, sorry, the, 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 the papal crown, if you like, the papal hat or mitre from the, from the Pope, and he places it on his own head. You see, in 1798, Napoleon took the power of the state away from Rome, from, from the papacy, and he threw the Pope in prison. Napoleon was bent on conquering Europe. The Pope was obviously in his way. And at that point, Rome ceased to become a, a state. It now was just a church. Remember, Rome had always been a church-state authority. Now it was church-state power. That's why the Bible says it was different from the other kingdoms before it. This was a religious, political kingdom. It worked in the realm of the state, but it also worked in the realm of religion. And that took place in 1798. But the Bible says that the deadly wound would be what? Healed. And in 1929, we have the Italian Prime Minister Mussolini signing a document that reinstated the, 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 the Vatican as self-governing, as a self-governing state. And there we have Vatican City today. Because the deadly wound would be healed. Now it's not healed yet. But the healing process began in 1929. The, he the wound is fully healed when it exercises the same kind of power as it did during those Middle Ages. And so we see again the unification of church and state. Now, Jesus, when he spoke of persecution, we need to qualify that statement. We need to qualify that statement. You know, I've been to churches where they talk about persecution and Christians talk about persecution. But Christ qualified that statement. He said, blessed are they which are persecuted for what? For righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what righteousness is in the Bible? Psalm 119, 172, the Bible says, 
My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. All thy commandments are righteousness. It's when God's people are persecuted for, for doing the will of God, for, for desiring to keep his commandments. If you love me, Jesus said what? Keep my commandments. That's why Paul, he says in 1 Corinthians 13, when he speaks about charity or love, he says, Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, profits me nothing, right? Does me no good. Because charity or love is defined by the keeping of God's commandments. The Apostle Paul says, Love is the fulfilling of the law. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. My friends, if we're not keeping God's commandments today, you can forget about keeping it in a time of persecution. I'm just amazed that people don't even believe that when Jesus said, if he, I remember talking to a man when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Talking to a man, he said, well, we can't keep his commandments, right? I said, so why would Jesus say it? Why would Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments, if it cannot be kept? We're saying the devil is greater than Christ. Never. Amen. No, we cannot keep it of ourselves. But the reason why people doubt that it can be kept is because their eyes are on themselves. Of course you cannot keep the commandments of God. But when you put your eyes on Christ, and when Christ lives in you and becomes your hope of glory, you will love to keep His commandments. Amen. That's the difference. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Thank you, brother. Take up your cross and follow me. I don't know what we're doing here if we're not having that experience with God. Overcomers. You know the name Israel? It means the prince that overcomes with God. That's what it means. But Rome has played around with God's law. Remember, it thinks to change times and laws. It's played around with the righteousness of Christ. Changes to God's times and law. Okay. If you look in the, uh, it says there at the bottom, um, second commandment removed, fourth commandment changed from Sabbath to Lord's Day, and tenth commandment split into two. You know, I, I had a look into the, uh, into the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. I had an old catechism someone gave to me because I wanted to check this out. And I looked and sure enough, the second commandment was removed. Do you know what that commandment says? Thou shalt not have any graven images, right? Like any graven images. Thou shalt bow down thyself to them, nor worship them. When you go to Rome, look at all the graven images. I mean, I used to sit in, I used to be a Catholic, I used to sit in church and just look at the statue of Peter and Mary and so forth and Jesus and statues everywhere and watch people praying to them. Abomination of desolation. You can't pray to a statue of Peter or a statue of Mary. I said it. Because it's truth. There is only one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, the Bible says. There are no saints up in heaven that I can pray to. It's Christ and Christ alone that saves, amen? amen. He, is, he is who God appointed. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in what? In Him should not perish but have eternal life. And so if you remove the second commandment, well, you're going to end up with nine commandments, so then you have to split the tenth commandment into two. And that's what Rome did to make up ten again. The Sabbath commandment was shortened. Now you'll see in some Catholic literature, the full commandment is there, but often it's shortened in, in, in a lot of literature. And there was a time where this was, it was always shortened, from what I've seen. 
And it just says, remember the Sabbath day. But the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So, so Satan now, by virtue of deception and by virtue of Rome, is keeping a people in unrighteousness. Keeping a people in transgression of God's laws. And when those people began to protest like the Protestants, like the Waldensians and the Albigenses and so forth, and began to protest against the teachings of Rome, saying it's unbiblical, she would persecute, torture, and put to death. And, and historians, they can't, they can't number it, but they say it, it, it exceeds at least 50 million Christians tried for the crime of heresy. And I tell you, friends, just one of those who died, just one of those who died, the value on one of those lives can only be estimated by the blood that Jesus Christ spilt for that soul. More than 50 million? That's why God says He has a controversy with the nations. Oh, my friends, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are people that don't know and are living according to the light that they have as Christians. They're being persecuted, but they're living according to the light that they know. Amen? But the world at large doesn't realize that it's, I'm talking about the Christian committee, is in breach of the seventh day Sabbath. And, and Adventists were, were very privileged to have a Baptist woman bring this knowledge to the church. So we could rejoice and say, Amen. It's the righteousness of Christ. Didn't Jesus keep the Sabbath commandment also? Did he keep Sunday or did he keep Saturday? He kept Saturday. Read Luke chapter 4. It was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He did what you and I are doing here today. But my friends, the Bible tells us of a time when church and state will come together again and... Uh, we, we were in Revelation 13 there, but if we read on in Revelation 13, it says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Do you know what's happening there? Church and state coming together again. You see that? Now, there's going to come a mark in the foreheads or in their hands, Okay, And no man can buy or sell except those that have that mark. And that comes from the beast that we just read about or, or, or the papacy or antichrist in the book of Revelation 13. This is not in reference to the people. Okay, I always like to put that disclaimer in. There are many Catholic people that are living up to the light they have. They love the Lord. I met one lady. She spoke of her conversion. She was a Catholic. She said her whole life was changed. And I, I praise the Lord with her. Amen. <laughs> Because she knew Jesus. But God's calling a people out of unrighteousness and He's calling a people into the light of truth. And so when the light of truth comes, we ought to be faithful to that light. But here, no man might buy or sell. My friends, that's talking about the state. It's, it's the laws that legislate whether you can buy or sell. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says church and state will come together again. And when it talks about the Ford, it's talking about conscience. I was at a man's house and his son came in and said, Dad, 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 the mark of the beast is coming. They've released this new microchip. The barcode 666. The man turned to me. He wasn't at Venice. I was just giving him a pastoral visit. He said to me, you at Venice know Bible prophecy, don't you? What do you think? Is, is that correct? And I said to him, well, let me share with you another verse. And this is the verse I'm going to share with you today. Revelation 7, speaking about God's people, it says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God, our God in their foreheads. So I said to him, like this is talking about God's people, right? So if God's going to seal his people in their foreheads, is he going to give them a microchip? No. It's got to do with the conscience, isn't that right? Yeah. 
and when it talks about the hand in reference to the beast, there's going to be those that, that are going to receive the mark of the big beast by, the, by making the choice to do so, to follow the beast. But when it talks about the hand, there's going to be force involved. And that force will come through the state because the moment you aren't able to buy or sell, the moment you aren't able to buy or sell, my friends, when your stomach is hungry, you'll be saying, you know what? I'm going to go with this. I'm going to go with this. So I said, no, it has to do with the conscience. And God's going to have a people that are going to be sealed in their mind. Now, Pastor Tappy will pick that up for us and continue. But we are now post-1798, the post the 1260 years. It's past, amen? amen? We are living at the end of time now. We're dealing with the time where the deadly wound is healing and Rome is going to come with a mark. I'll leave Pastor Tappy to share that with you. But God's going to have his people. They're going to come with a seal. But my friends, when church and state come together and persecution comes, that means that we're not going to have the freedoms that we now enjoy. What's Australia debating at the moment? Right now, there's draft legislation in Parliament House right now today. What is Australia debating at the moment? Religious freedom. Religious freedom. My friends, this is what's coming. And the Christian community and, and, and others and even many non-Christians are saying, look, this draft legislation doesn't, doesn't allow for the religious freedom that we now, that, that we've, been, we've been known and we've enjoyed as a country. No, it's beginning to, this, this legislation is beginning to encroach on that legislation. And so we found even with the same-sex marriage laws that came in, that Christians were being dragged into court and being threatened with jail because they do not subscribe to a same-sex marriage and in business would not cater for that. Remember the guy that made wedding cakes? Own business, he was a Christian. Didn't want to make a cake with two men on top of it. Got dragged into court, threatened with jail. Things have changed, friends, and things are moving very quickly. Right now, my friends, see these prophecies? They speak to today, amen? They speak right now. We, the Australian government is going to decide whether we have our religious freedoms or we don't. Anyone know that face up there? Previous president of Greater Sydney Conference, Pastor Michael Worker. He was part... He was part of that discussion. He was, uh, him and, and other Christians, very concerned. I mean, uh, they want to bring, I mean, the schools are under scrutiny now. Christian schools are, are, are feeling the pressure of the state because they may have to change the way they do things. If someone in the school says, I don't believe in, you know, in heterosexual marriage, I, you know, I believe in homosexual marriage, and they sh and. Uh, and I read one case, actually, where they feel that they should be free to be able to share that. And the school's saying, no, you can't. That's not our principle. That doesn't hold to our principles. That doesn't hold to our values. But they're taking the school to court right now. I think it was in Victoria. Religious freedoms are being stripped away right before your eyes and my eyes. God has a controversy with the nations. And if Australia keeps going this way, my friends, God has a controversy with Australia. He's pleading through the gospel, pleading the mercy and the blood of His Son. He's calling a people to truth, calling a people to faith that they today might believe and come to Him in repentance, my friends. But don't despair. Because... We are so close to the second coming of Christ. Amen? We are so close to the second coming of Jesus. Today we need to make decisions on whether our relationship is right with God as it should be or not. We've got to stop making excuses. 
We're going to stop letting our attention be drawn this way and this way. Today, we've got to make a decision for Christ. Because our lives are worth the blood that was shed on Calvary. Amen. Infinite, infinite value. Your life is worth the blood of the divine Son of God shed for your sins. Who wants to make a stand for Jesus today? Amen? Make a stand. We'll make a literal stand. Let's stand for Jesus. Amen? Let's stand for Jesus. And may we thank the Lord as history in the light of prophecy has give us, gives, given us this morning cause to believe in the one who loved us that he gave his life for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to have a moment, Lord, just to solidify these decisions, Lord, with your blessing in the sight of heaven, Father, and with your Holy Spirit speaking to us. Oh, Father, things are happening right before our eyes, Lord. And the world at large has no idea. The world at large, Lord, is watching the football. The world at large is playing computer games and going to the movies, Lord. The world at large, Lord, is so filled with entertainment, it has no idea, Lord, what is happening. But, Father, those who are called by your name, Father, will be ready, Father, for that coming. I think of our scripture reading, Lord, where we started, Lord, where Paul says that that day, Lord, will not catch us unaware. To many it will come as a thief in the night, but to those who believe, Lord, we are not caught unaware. And we are looking forward, Father, knowing how close we are, Father, to the second coming of your Son. We are looking forward to that glorious day, Lord, when you will usher in your everlasting kingdom. But today, Lord, we receive it and we come into it by faith through the cleansing blood of your Son. Please forgive us our sins, Father. And establish us as your people, Lord. And move us, Lord, in the faith of your Son, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.